welcome to Human to Human, Gabrielle. I am so excited to have you here. I'll give you a little introduction to start off. Gabrielle Stone is an actress and author of the book Eat, Pray, FML, and also the podcast host of FML Talk, which I assume is kind of a jump off of the book that you started to kind of be able to talk more into your story and everything. Yes, I totally was against doing a podcast at first and my readers kept demanding it. So I've in quarantine, I finally got forced into doing it. But I'm so happy that I did. I mean, as you know, from hosting this one, it's a really incredible way to reach people on a weekly basis and be able to continue to influence and inspire people, which is what I set out to do in the first place. 100%. It's amazing. And I love, I feel like as such avid readers of the book and, you know, getting really invested in your story, which we'll dive into, it's like, we need more. Like all all we got was, okay, so to to give a little like synopsis of the book, um, which is based on your life and you wrote it as it was happening. um, Well, it starts off, it's it's crazy. I feel like I'm getting like throwbacks to the moments I was reading it just uh, in the past couple of weeks. (laughs) But to start off, you share so vulnerably that you lost your father at the age of seven and you found him. Um, and then you also lost the first boyfriend you ever had. He passed away. And so that, you know, stemmed right into thinking that when you love someone, they leave. So that's a huge, a huge thing. And so then the basis of Eat, Pray, FML, I love Eat, Pray, FML, because obviously it's right off of Eat, Pray, Love, which it just (laughs) absolutely is not this like love story. So. Gabrielle uh, is married to a guy named Daniel and you find out that for six months he's been cheating on you with a 19 year old which is crazy and it's funny because I'm 19 so to like oh my god I love it well not all (laughs) 19 year olds are the same I don't put you all into that category don't worry (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I would not assume so. Um, and then after going through this divorce or in the process of it, it's not even official, you fall madly in love with Javier and he convinces you to go on this month crazy whirlwind romance vacation to Europe. And 48 hours before you're supposed to go, he cancels or not cancels, but says, you know, he's going through a lot of grief. He lost his brother and says to you that he needs to do this alone to really grow on your own journey. And so this whole book is about your experience deciding to go on this Europe trip and do it and do it by yourself and learn so much. And I'm excited to talk about this because boys is a story. Yeah, it was a really wild time in my life. And I remember when I was going through it all, people like my friends would call me and say, hey, we're just curious as to like what was going on with this week's episode of your Netflix show life, because it really had turned into this sick and twisted sitcom that I was now living. And so when I realized I was going on this trip alone instead of with the man I was madly in love with and had fallen head over heels for, I was like, I have to tell this story. And I picked up a leather bound journal the day before I left on my trip, started writing my first day in London. And I wrote three fourths of it on my Europe trip. And it was really like therapy for me. I don't think I would have gotten through 2017 without writing this book. Yeah, that's insane. And so I, I, that's awesome. Cause I want to start with the psychic because just you speaking to the psychic and can you give a little synopsis of what she told you? Yeah. So it was really weird because my mom and I had gone to see her do one of her live shows, which was incredible. Um, And I hold people that do this to a very high standard. Like I've had a session with John Edwards. I I don't mess around and I do believe in it. So I'm always kind of like, all right, prove yourself to me. But what was so weird about this particular situation is that my mom had gifted me a session with her for Christmas um, and she was so far booked out that I had to book the appointment like eight months down the road. And it just so happened that when this session came up and it was scheduled, I was going through the first little flits of infidelity with my now ex-husband. Um, so I go into her office. I have my hands like tucked into my sweatshirt sleeve. She doesn't know if I have a ring on or not. Um, and she proceeded to tell me everything about my life. I mean, everything. So she knew that my husband at the time that there was infidelity questions coming up, that the woman in question um, probably didn't live in this state, which was true about the woman I knew about at that time, um, that he was an athlete who probably needed to have his ego struck. Like the amount of information that she knew about my life without even having any clue. And none of this was like, you can't Google any of this. Like I was going through it that instant. Um, She then proceeds to tell me that 
you know, I, I do think it's salvageable or not salvageable. She said, I think that your journey with him isn't over. Like there's something else that needs to happen before it's completed. And obviously that was for me to find out all of the details and get a divorce. Um, but that she did see another soulmate for me that was much stronger. So that of course piqued my interest when I was already like thinking about divorce at the time. And she then says, you know, the next six to seven months are going to be really rocky for you and it's going to feel like a roller coaster. So really try and stay balanced. And then tells me, I really, really need you writing. And she kept saying this over and over throughout the session. And I was like, Jesus, like I don't, at the time I was just acting and directing. So I was like, I don't have anything to write about. Like, I don't know what screenplay I should start on. Like, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Lo and behold, I fall madly into the arms of Javier and you know, I was like, whatever, psychic medium lady, like, it's fine. I'm happier than I've ever been. Nope. Sure enough. Six to seven months, super fucking rocky. And, um, and you know, the second I started writing the book, I remember in London, I had this moment. I was like, oh, she needs me to be writing. And it all kind of clicked because in that moment, I very much so was like, this is my purpose. I'm supposed to be writing this book. Wow. That's amazing. And it's just crazy that she hit every nail right on the head. And as it started to unfold, you were like, oh, this is true. And oh, this is just happening. And it was in such a short period of time. Yeah. It was like checking off boxes as as I went. And even like today, not today and today, but in, in my life now, I still look back on that session. And I remember her saying, you know, you're going to step away from being in front of the camera and from uh, step away from acting for a good four to five years. And you're probably not going to come back to in front of the camera to do some really amazing work until your late thirties. And of course I'm sitting there at 28 going, wait, what? That's what I do. I'm trying to be an actress. Like, what do you mean? And of course, then I write a book, become an author that completely takes me in another career direction. And I'm like watching this now happen. And I'm like, oh my God, she was fucking right again. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. Oh, it's insane. And I, and I'm so excited to talk about the writing aspect of it. I love writing and I'm so curious about that, but I also want to dive into kind of the more story before we get to the writing part. So I'm curious, was it on the trip or was it beforehand when you started to really realize that losing your dad at such a young age and experiencing so much grief in your life, that abandonment issues were there? When did you start to be able to really process that? Um, I had known about the abandonment. You know, my mom is a healer uh, apart from being an actress. She does a lot of like energy work. And so I've known for quite a long time that the things I've gone through in my life created a fear of abandonment. That was like no surprise to me. Um, but when I found out I was going to have to go on this trip by myself, or I was going to get to go on this trip by myself, um, that was when it really clicked that, okay, the universe is delivering me a clear way to go face that shit head on. Like it was very normally, you know, when you believe that everything happens for a reason, you can't see it until you're further down the line. But this was one of those moments where I was in it and I was like, nope, I know exactly why it's happening. I know that this is going to be a something way bigger than I can understand right now. Um, what I did have, the, I, I did have a different realization around the fear of abandonment. And that was when, and I write about this in the book, but that's when I was sitting with Javier and I was talking to him about the grief he felt around his brother. And he was like, I feel like if I ever love someone that much again, they're going to die. And I was like, oh, dude, I so identify with that because I've dealt with that belief my whole life. And I said to him, I was like, my dad died and I loved him and I loved my high school sweetheart and he died. So then I married my ex-husband because he was safe. And it was like this huge, like massive explosion realization in my head. And I was like, oh my God, how had I never put that together before that moment that as a protection of myself, not wanting to go through losing that and seeing that belief come to fruition again, that I had put up this like safety net. So I went and did one of the biggest steps you can do is getting married to someone who I wasn't fully in love with because it kept me safe. Mm -hmm. That was like a huge thing for me to realize. 
That's crazy. And and it's interesting to kind of read that too and see that unfold in the book is that like, you know, a couple chapters in, I was like, oh, wow. Like seeing how hard you fell in love with Javier, then comparing it to Daniel, it's like, there's such a clear difference there. And I'm curious if you feel like now that there's kind of a happy medium to it though, because I feel like Daniel, there ended up being obviously so much toxic- toxicity and, and just negative things. And he was a safe option, but Javier was like passionate and fast, but then like such big heartbreak. And yeah. do you think there's like an in-between? Have you experienced that in-between? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm in the in-between now, yay. Um, but it took me a long time to recognize the in-between and get comfortable in the in-between because I had just left this like loveless marriage with my ex-husband and fallen into this like fiery, passionate, intense um, relationship with Javier. And to me at the time, I went, oh my God, I've never even been in love because like this is obviously what it's supposed to feel like. Holy shit. Like where have I been? What have I been doing? Um, And that became my new definition of what love is supposed to feel like. Um, Looking back on it now with all the perspective that I have, that intenseness and that fire is like a drug, like an addictive drug. And it's not healthy. It's not going to be able to have any longevity in a relationship. And it's got a lot of different forms of toxicity in it. So when I met my current man, um, and a lot of this will uh, be, you know, explained in detail in book number two that I'm currently writing. Um, But I kept feeling like something was missing. And that missing thing was that fiery, intense, addictive, obsessive almost quality, um, which isn't healthy. And I had to do a lot of work on myself to really be like, okay, nothing's missing. I just need to redefine what my definition of love is. Mm. Um, And when I realized that, it was like, oh, like that's – everyone on the outside was going like, are you crazy? Why are you walking away from this amazing man? Like what's wrong with you? What are you doing? Um, Nobody really got it. And now that I've shifted that understanding, I get it. Um, And it's it's this weird middle ground because – Honestly, in the long run, like, yes, you want that passion. Yes, you want that like fire. But no matter who that's with, that will fade, whether it's in three months, three years, 30 years. And when that does fade, you want to be left with someone that you can laugh with, that you can cry with, that takes care of your triggers and your wounds and knows you and loves you and, and, is your partner in life. Um, Yes, it's great to have some of those other qualities on top of that. um, But that's where the real like gold in a relationship and a partnership is. Um, And it took me a long time to redefine my views on that and to really accept and acknowledge that. Wow. I am so glad you just went into that detail of it because I was so curious and I love how you brought your current man onto your podcast. And I just listened to that episode (laughs) and you can tell there's so much love and there's so much acceptance there. And especially with, you know, you talking all the time about these crazy experiences you had with your exes and having someone there to love and support you unconditionally without, you know, the insane passion that there is there. But it's so clear with Javier, that there's such highs, but then there's such lows, especially when you're traveling around Europe. Yeah, it was a constant roller coaster. Um, and I wish it could say I, you know, got off the ride after Europe and was like, I'm leaving the amusement park. But um, obviously, we wouldn't have a book too if I did that. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, it's it's tough, especially with my current relationship now, God love him. Um, you know, this is my job. I talk about both of my exes multiple times a day, um, in a very deep and personal way. And it's not like he came into my life and, you know, I had written a book and these were my exes. And like, that was that, like, there's been very complicated intertwinings of our stories, um, with, you know, me and him breaking up and getting back together. And it's, it's a lot for him to handle. And I freaking applaud him every day that he does. So, um, we continuously navigate it together. Um, and I don't know if anyone else 
would be able to handle it, quite frankly. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's crazy, but incredible. And I think it shows how important it is to set that standard that someone will love you and accept you for everything that you are and everything that you've been through and all your triggers and your traumas. And I think it's really interesting to really read in the book too, how I would love for you to kind of talk about, you know, you, I think, I would assume you saw the grief that Javier was going through and, and no grief yourself and just wanted to be there to support him, but also, you know, put your needs less than that to be there for him. Yeah, 100%. I think it was really difficult for me because when I've been grieving, which has happened multiple times in my life, unfortunately, um, I just want to be taken care of. I want to crawl into a bed with whoever I am closest to and not leave. I don't ever want to leave their side. Um, That's just my personal way of dealing with grief. So it was really difficult to go from being at level 100 with this man. Um, And again, it's not for people that haven't read the book to give some context. It's not like his brother suddenly, you know, died when we were together. This had happened a year and a half before we were a thing. Um, not to say that that's less valid, but, you know, I I was under the impression that he had, you know, healed and, and dealt with his grief around that um, in, to a point of where it wouldn't consume him in the way that it suddenly did. Um, so I was really confused by the fact that it was like, I love you. I'm, you're meeting my parents. This is my woman. We're going to have babies together. I'm done. Like so heavy. Um, And his friends and family all saying like, we've never seen him like this. Oh my God. Like his mother and I were like, where should we go on like a celebratory trip when we get engaged? Like we were, (laughs) this was it. We were done. Um, And to see that flip so drastically and be like, okay, you feel all these things for me. Shouldn't I be the person that you want to just take care of you and help get you through this? And I, I stayed and was offering to do that. I was like, look, if we have to go on this trip and have hysterical crying talks every day for you to get through this and we come back as just friends, like that's what we'll do. Um, I was really like invested in, in being, that person for him. And I think at the end of the day, when all was said and done, the grief did play a factor in it. But I think I know he's also a man and he fucking panicked. Um, I think Mm -hmm. it was a really confusing um, combination of the two. Yeah, that's wow. That's a great point to make because yeah, the way you describe it in the book is that, you know, he's madly in love with you. You guys have been together for a month or a couple weeks at that time and woke, went to bed and woke up the next morning and the feelings weren't there. Yeah, it was it was wild to me and nobody could understand it. I would have in-depth conversations with his mother and um, she would be like, that's not possible. You can't just go to bed and love with someone and wake up and have it be gone. So I get that he's going through something, but that's not possible. Yeah. Um, it was really a, a weird mind fuck to say the least. Well, I think it's so interesting too to bring up that it was a year and a half um, later after his brother had passed. It wasn't an immediate thing that happened while you were together. And I, I think it, it makes so much sense even for me to hear it right now that he probably had a part of him that really panicked because it was so intense and so passionate, the love that you two shared that, and he invited you on this trip. And then 48 hours before it's like, Oh my God, I'm about to go spend, you know, a month. I think due to the intensity, somebody could, you know, get shaken in their boots, but the way he dealt with it is crazy. Totally. And that too. And I think that, you know, it's, it's such a weird situation because for me, I was kind of letting him dictate how hot and heavy things were going. Like I was all for it, but like, I wasn't the one that was going to be like, come to Europe with me. I wasn't the one that was like, meet my mother. You know, it was very much so on his end that was like, oh my God, this is it. Let's go fast and furious, full force. Um, So I just went along with that because I, I trusted the universe and I fell. I do think that, he had a lot of grief that was undealt with that he stuffed down because it was too painful for him to get through. And when those emotions during our relationship started happening to him, it kind of opened up a floodgate. I do believe that, but yeah, I mean, 
I, I do think he's a man and he panicked at, at yeah. some point. It's yeah. just a weird panic to have when you're the one that's initiating that's driving it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about this a little bit in your episode about grief on your podcast that, you know, when you don't deal with your grief right away or you don't not even deal with it is the right word, but just allow yourself to feel what you need to feel. I think something like that can happen. It comes up later. I actually experienced something very much like that, which is crazy to say. I'm just like realizing that now, but I had my grandfather passed away when I was in grade eight and I didn't talk about it. I didn't process it. And then two years later when I was 16, it like came out in front of my entire photography class when I was like talking about a really personal piece of artwork I'd created. And then I was like, whoa, this has been in there for a really long time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it does that even if you have dealt with it, there's times, you know, like my dad passed when I was six, seven years old. So there's, you know, I, I've talked about it in interviews. I've talked about it with friends and family, like, but there's weird random moments where I'll be talking about it and something comes up and it's just grief is really weird in that sense, um, where it ebbs and flows. That being said, um, I do know that from talking to like friends and family and to Javier that, he was not okay when I came into his life. He seemed okay to me um, and he was portraying that he was okay, Um, but he was not. Like a lot of people were actually very worried about what a dark and scary place he was in. Um, And so I know that I came into his life to shift that for him. Um, And that's a huge blessing to him and to me. Um, And I know that we're both really thankful for that. And he came into my life to legitimately push me to face a bunch of deep stemming subconscious beliefs and to write a book and completely change my career path to to helping a lot of people around the world. So it as painful as the the whole 2017 fiasco was, I would not change a moment of it because I'm sitting right here right now. Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. And I think there's so much to be said about that. And especially in terms of 2020 and everything that, you know, each person has experienced and getting hit with the pandemic and, and, you know, so many of the terrible things, you know, we can go through, we can look back and say, oh my God, I wouldn't be where I am right now if those, that, those horrible experiences didn't happen. And it is crazy to think about how much those couple months of your life shifted the course of the rest of it and the rest of your career. Completely. I mean, I always say I am a walking example that everything happens for a reason, but it's so true. Um, I mean, and even like the the domino effect of things happening, like, you know, people ask me a lot, did you put a, a wall up around your heart and was your guard up after your your ex-husband cheated on you? And I'm like, well, no. And can you imagine if I did? Like, I would have never fallen in love. I wouldn't have gotten my heart broken, wouldn't have gone on the trip, wouldn't have wrote the book. Like, it's it's a domino effect. And on a smaller scale, You know, I remember in the kind of like final notes um, uh, of the last chapter of Eat, Pray, FML, I I talk about kind of the domino effect and everything happening for a reason on on the trip itself. Um, Like if I hadn't have met this person, I wouldn't have ended up going to this city and then I wouldn't have done this. Like it's everything literally in that three month period felt like the universe drew a map, put me at the beginning of it and was like, okay, these are all the points she needs to hit. And this is where we're ending up. Yeah. It felt that way. <laughs> yeah. Especially I loved reading that part, especially with the amount of people, the different people you met and the different things they did for you and where they led you and how it's, it's crazy. I'm such a planner. So to think about going on a trip to Europe and you didn't know where your next de- destination was, you just let it come to you. And that was in a crazy way when so much shit has come your way to trust the universe though, to take you where you're meant to go. Totally. And I'm the same way. I overplan everything. My friends like joke about it that I I know what I'm having for dinner on Friday and it's Tuesday. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, it really, I wouldn't have been able to have the experiences that I had if I would have had enough time to plan, even if I would have had a week to plan, like it had to have been 48 hours before the trip, my entire bag was already packed, ready to go. It it made me just like let all that go. Um, so to book everything as I was in the city that I was in um, and just decide where I was going next and then still have the freedom to not be locked into a schedule, like it really made the trip what it was. And I'm so grateful that it 
it forced me to, uh, to experience it in that way. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think I love your tactic too, of the thought onion while you were on this trip. And I really want to dive into that too. And I think at one point you mentioned either in the book or in one of your podcast episodes that you're like, this is how I had a therapy, how I had therapy when I couldn't in Europe. And so do you want to give a little explanation of what the thought onion was and what it did for you? Yeah. So the thought onion came about when I was in London for the first day walking around and I had felt like such a badass. And I was like, hell yeah, Gabrielle, you went on this trip, like screw all the men that have broken you. Like here you are adventuring around. Um, just like had a, such an amazing first day. And then I had gotten a, a text from Javier with like a bunch of pictures of him in Rome and it totally triggered me. And I was so upset. It completely like shifted my entire mood of my awesome day that I just had. So as I'm walking back to the train station, I'm like stomping my feet along the city streets, um, being all pissed off. And, you know, my inner voice goes, okay, well, do you want to continue to be pissed off about it? Or do you want to figure out like what's going on? I was like, fine, let's, let's figure it out. Um, so that's where the thought onion was born. And what it is, is a way to look at your thoughts to, really analyze them and figure out what subconscious thought or belief is fueling that. Um, And when you can get to the subconscious level, then you can be like, oh, okay, this is what I need to shift or adjust or work on so that I can have a different reaction in the future and therefore heal. Um, So you look at it like an onion. um, And the first layer is the superficial thought, which is usually your initial superficial, you know, reaction that you have to something. The second layer is the authentic thought, which is the emotion that's underneath that superficial reaction and what could be possibly driving and causing that. And then the last layer underneath that is the subconscious thought, which is like the belief that you've probably been holding for many, many years, maybe stemming back to childhood, um, something that you've had a trauma around. um, And that's really where the golden like nugget is in the whole process. And it's funny too, because I went home after I did all this in my head and wrote it down, obviously. Um, And I remember writing it for the first time. I was like, the thought onion, that's such a lame name. I have to change that eventually. But then I just didn't. And I kept writing it throughout my trip. And by the end of it, I was like, well, I kind of like it now. I think I'm going to leave it. And and it's kind of perfect, the perfect name for it. So I'm glad it ended up sticking. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And it's and it's crazy. So many of the times when you do the thought onion and you do it a lot. And I think that's I, I think that'll definitely flow into discussing how important writing must have been for you in that yeah. journey, because the amount of times when it when it finally got to the subconscious thought, it was like it was like, oh, Oh, yeah. that's big or that was a big feeling or this is stemming back to something you know that you had attached to your father passing or a fear of being alone or you know something that you were really feeling towards Javier which you wouldn't be able to get if you weren't writing and thinking that deeply about your own thoughts yeah it literally became a tool that allowed me to go through 10 sessions of therapy by myself in 10 minutes um and it really it's something that's so easy for anyone to do. I've had a lot of my readers reach out to me um, and they'll be like, I, I keep a journal that's specifically for thought onions now. Um, and I love that because, you know, my mom is a, apart from an actress, she's a world healer and does very high level energy work. Um, so I'm very versed in that and I've grown up in that with her, but I needed and wanted something that was simpler that like you didn't need to call a healer to do that you could just do by yourself and get some results and and get some answers around. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I love how much it allowed you to dive into what you were really thinking and really feeling and were able to get clear on what you needed to say to Javier, the next steps that needed to be made. And it even made me think about what we were chatting about before is I feel like when you're going through, you know, such intense grief, like he said he was, I think he experienced such a high when he saw you that he like clutched onto that and it got so, so high and so intense and wanted to, and and I'm, I'm learning this in my own life is to when you hold on to things so tight, I think that's when they blow up. And, yeah. and he was holding on so tight that then it went to the other extreme where I was like, oh, I can't even be around you because I don't even know how to feel or think. Yeah. We, um, we actually just recorded an episode for FML talk where everybody kept asking like to do an episode about Javier and I was so resistant to it. Um, but I brought my producer on and we sat down and actually had a really good talk about it because she 
knows him as well. Um, now, at least she didn't when I was going through all of this, but I had come to the realization when I saw a video on TikTok, of course, because that's where I get half of my information nowadays. Um, <laughs> where I find and, all my guests, <laughs> and my good right, books. I love it. I love it. Um, and I saw this video on love bombing where a person with some type of void inside themselves or that's like looking to fill some type of hole that's been left in their heart or soul um, looks for someone and finds someone that they think is going to fill that up and they like attach onto it super intensely and like shower them with love and they're like it's this very like intense connection that you know both of them are like oh my god and then they realize somewhere that that's not going to fill that space because obviously no one else can fill that space. Only you can feel, fill that space in yourself. And when they realize that, it's like, oh, I got to go. And they cut things off really intense and drastically. And I'm sitting here watching this video and I'm like, oh my God, that's what happened to me. <laughs> like I was love bombed. And it's such a gnarlier heartbreak than it is when you've been with someone for three years and like something happens or something just doesn't work out. Like, because you're cutting things off in the height of the honeymoon stage and you're just like, it's this gaping wound that it is left. And nobody really teaches you a, what love bombing even is and B how the hell to like fix yourself and put yourself back together after it happens to you. So it was like this huge realization. And I was like, oh my God, there's actually a thing for what I went through, um, which makes sense why I get so many DMs from my readers saying that they've gone through the exact same thing or something really similar. Oh my God. Yeah. My brain right now is being like, <laughs> hmm, I'm thinking about all of my experiences with exes or heartbreak or anything. And I think you also, it, when you go through such a heartbreak like that, you don't know how to put yourself back together, like you said. And then it's interesting, like my podcast is a big product of going through a breakup, going through a heartbreak, having the pandemic hit. And I think ways for us to get through it and cope it, cope with it is to be able to be like, okay, I need to write about this. I need to talk about this. I need to know. For me, I was like, oh my God, other people have experienced this too through conversations with friends. And I was like, I need to put stuff out there to say like, what you're feeling is totally normal and valid. And I think it's important to become vulnerable enough to share that. So we we don't feel like, you know, it still sucks, but we don't feel like we're completely alone in it. 100% because we're so not alone. Um, I knew this book was going to resonate with people, um, because grief and heartbreak is universal. And I knew that everyone has gone through one of the things that I go through in this book. Um, but I didn't realize how many people were going to have such similar situations, like leaving one big relationship, diving into another, having him have a change of heart so quickly. And even men too. I get a lot of male readers that are like, I have a a Javier situation, but it's with a woman. Um, and it's, it's wild what we humans go through and how we feel so secluded and alone when we deal with things when so many other people are dealing with them as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so I also want to dive into like the self-care talk cocktail and yeah. finding that and discovering that through writing, through, you know, learning to prioritize yourself and not always putting others first too in your, in your journey. Yeah, that was a big one for me. Um, and a lot of, I know a lot of people that read the book are like screaming at the pages sometimes because they're like, why can't you just focus on yourself and leave Javier out of it? Like, just go be you. And it's so different when you're invested in the situation and you've gone through all of the moments with that person. And I think I have, you know, a very maternal uh, instinct about me, especially when it comes to grief because I've gone through it so much. Um, so I think it would have been like that, even if it was with my girlfriend, like I feel this intense need to protect and take care of the people that like I end up loving. Um, but the self-love cocktail actually didn't come until I came home from Europe and was home for a while, which is why I write about it in the epilogue. Cause it didn't feel super authentic to write it on my trip. And my editor pushed for it too. She was like, I think it needs to be somewhere on the trip. And I'm like, no dude, I didn't fucking learn it then. <laughs> um, so I came home from Europe and this will all, you know, be in book two as well, but I was really depressed. Like be, I had gone through all of this stuff and then Europe was this crazy high with obviously unfathomable lows, but I, it was always moving. I was always on this constant roller coaster one way or another. And I got home and all of that stopped. 
and I was suddenly stagnant. And I've dealt with depression and anxiety my whole life on and off, but it was never like this. I mean, I was bad. And I remember one day, you know, I had had this continuous want to just like be in bed and not do anything. I was like, I want to lay here. I want to eat shitty food and I want to like watch a TV show and not have to think about life. And I was like, okay, I knew I had to get out of this like pit of depression that I was in. And, you know, I had to like really get back to a life, you know, which unfortunately being in front of the camera and being an actress, like involved going to the gym and like, you know, being healthy and getting outside. (laughs) And um, so I remember being like, okay, what are the things that used to make you feel good? Because even then I was so deep that it wasn't like, what makes me happy? I was like, nothing makes me happy right now. So I was like, what used to really like make me happy and make me feel good? And I wrote down that list and I put that list on my mirror. And every day I would be like, okay, you have to do at least one thing on this list. And if you've done at least one thing on this list, then you've earned being in bed or, you know, lounging by the pool, doing whatever you feel like doing. So at first it was like one thing a day, one thing a day, one thing a day. And then it was like, okay, two things a day, two things a day, and you can do whatever you want. And then by the time I got to like three things a day, a couple of weeks in, I was feeling like I didn't need the reward at the other end, you know, because I started feeling better. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is how the self-love cocktail was really born. And when I realized that loving yourself is just as simple as giving your soul the things that you love, it was life-changing for me. Um, so if I'm ever feeling shitty or sad, um, that's what I revert back to. If people are ever like, I don't know how to get over this. I don't know how to feel better. I'm like, do your self-love cocktail because it really, the consistency with it is life-changing. And the fact that I could control it, It wasn't like, I always thought self-love was like looking in the mirror and being like, I love you, Gabrielle. You're amazing. I was like, I feel (laughs) psychotic right now. Um, I was like, I need something that I can actually physically do like a task. Um, And this, this did that for me. You know, when you think of loving your parent or your brother or sister or significant other, when you want them to feel love from you, you do things that they recognize and they feel as love. So when you're trying to love yourself, like why would you not do the same thing? Um, And it has to be a list that you're in control of. It can't be like, oh, well, I love when so-and-so does this with me. It's got to be things that you can do for yourself. So for me personally, mine was creating, dancing, going to the gym, meditating, um, really like things that I could give myself. And it totally, A, pulled me out of my depression, but B, really turned my entire life around. Wow. That's amazing. And it's, and it's huge to think of tangible things that we can do for ourselves that will fill our own cup. Because I think when you're in such a state like that, that's when you become dependent on other people or external forces that are out of your control to fill those holes. And that's when you enter the danger zone where you're out of control of, you know, really being the one to fulfill yourself. 100%. And I, I'm also a really big advocate when you're going through any type of grief, any type of heartbreak, any type of anything, To really be aware of, I mean, I say be aware of because some people are like, I have to have my glass of wine at night. But like I'm, for me personally, when I deal with stuff, no substances. Like I'm very, it's like eat well, go to the gym, drink a shit ton of water, get sleep. Um, Because the moment you start adding in substances to like soothe that, it's going to prolong the process of you healing. So it's so important in my opinion to keep a clear mind when you're walking through trauma or any type of like depression or sadness. It's it's a really big thing to be able to do. Mm, that's a really great point, especially because it numbs it and the fact that it will prolong it. It doesn't solve it. It just makes it last longer and become harder to solve. Completely. Yeah. And I am also so curious, you know, being in that state when you got home, how did you feel trying to finish this book? How did you begin to read back over it or finish writing it and get into that that headspace that you were in for the, that time in Europe? Yeah, I wrote three fourths of it on the Europe trip by hand in my journal in cursive because I'm a masochist like that, I guess. Um, and I came home 
typed it all into my computer, which was like an edit, you know, because I was like changing stuff as I was transferring it in. Um, but that was like the first time I really had reread everything that I had written. But the chapters that I had to write when I came home, uh, apart from like finishing out little bits um, that I that I hadn't finished on the trip, was the divorce stuff and falling in love with Javier. So here I was in this like giant pit of depression going back and rereading all of these text messages and all of these like loving, you know, sentiments where to, to create and craft these chapters, which are so important because if you as a reader don't understand the relationship and the dynamic and how much we were both in it, you're not going to understand why the heartbreak was so massive and like what the rest of the journey really entailed. Um, so those chapters are vital to, to people understanding and connecting with it. Um, and those were hell for me to write because normally when you go back and you analyze your, your past relationships that have, that are ended, um, you're like, Oh, I can, I can see where I misstepped or I can see where this was the point where something shifted. There was none of that. It literally went from we are madly in love to I woke up feeling off, which inevitably off meant like I don't have feelings for you anymore. Um, so to go through that and go through and copy verbatim these freaking like lovey-dovey text messages from this man was really fucking painful in the state that I was already in. Um, but I finished the entire book in three and a half months. So I, I wrote for another two months once I came home after that. We shopped it to publishers. Some of them passed. Others were like, we, we like it, but we want to tone it down, change it. Um, everybody was scared that like the title was going to be controversial. And I was like, you guys, it's literally a satirical play on a classic book. Like, the, what is the problem? Um, and I didn't want to tone it down and I didn't want to change it. Um, I wanted, I knew how it needed to be put out into the world, how people were going to resonate with it. Even when my mom read the first rough draft, she was like, oh, Gabrielle, are you sure you don't want to change your name or take out one of the guys you slept with? And I was like, no, because everybody's gonna fucking relate to like the yes. real. Yes. Oh my God. A hundred percent. Even like, especially the first guy when you're, I don't know where you were, but was it was with yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you're in Amsterdam and it was with a guy from Ireland that you call Ireland in the book. And you know, reading it and and you're you explaining that, you know, you didn't really care to sleep with him and then you ended up sleeping with him. It's like, I think so many of us can relate to that. And it's funny because I was reading it and I was like, why? And then I was like, oh, I've done that. Right. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh, I've been and and you know, it's just it's so raw and authentic. And that's what I love so much about it is that it's so interesting. People read it and they're like, mm, tone it down or mm, change this. And you're like, this is this is what it was. And yeah. it's crazy that you read it back over or and you were writing the the parts about falling in love and the divorce and are like, wow, there was no escalation here. There was no warning signs. There was no red flag. It was yeah. like, and I think I, and I hope that's validating in some form that you're like, you know what? I couldn't have seen this coming and it's not. 100%. Yeah, totally. It really is. I mean, obviously with my ex-husband, I look back and it was like fucking red flag city. I was like, I should have <laughs> realized that I was at a racetrack at the point <laughs> like that, at that point. But, um, but no, yeah, it is. It's, it's validating in the sense of like, I was warranted in feeling the way that I felt. I was experiencing something that was real on both ends and I don't feel any guilt that I did something to shift that, Yeah, which is a big thing when you're going through a, a really like gnarly break um, that came out of nowhere to not feel like you did something wrong or to feel some type of shame or guilt around that is a really big thing to be able to have. Yeah. And I'm sure it's easy to kind of sit and question, oh, I should have done this or I could have done this instead or I could have seen that coming. But really writing that and also putting it out to the world for people to see that you were like, I fell flat on my face and didn't see it coming. And look at how I picked myself back up and figured it out. <laughs> yep. 100 percent. And I think that that is really like the beauty of it, you know, because I didn't look when I started writing this on the first day, I didn't know that I was going to have some epic outcome where this was going to be like, I mean, look, I will say I knew that this book was going to resonate with a lot of people. And I knew that this was going to be a big thing in my life. 
but I didn't know it was going to be a bestseller. I didn't know that like I was going to connect with all of these people all over the world and that it was going to totally change my life. And I didn't know that I was going to have a epic outcome from it. You know, I just knew that the story needed to be told for some reason. So it really, you know, ended up validating the whole thing. And it became a very full circle moment when I get to like connect with all of these readers and hear that it's helped change their lives in some way. Yeah, it's amazing. And I am I also want to know kind of how you're doing now writing the second book and you talk a bit about um, your partner and how there was a breakups on on and off and you got back together and it is a challenging experience writing and kind of going back to that place because it's interesting you you were in a really dark place and had to write about the past and now you're in a different place and have to write about you know, it's 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 a I, I can't imagine. That's so interesting. I've never actually looked at it like that. That's such a valid point. Um, It's like totally flip-flopped, which is kind of great. Yeah, it's been really difficult for a few reasons writing the second book. One, because um, Eat, Pray, FML, I wrote as I was going through it. So it was happening. And then I would write about it the day after or the week after, like very close to when it was actually happening in my life. Um, The second one spans from right when I come home from Europe in 2017, all the way to December of 2019. So it's way more time, you know, Eat, Pray, FML, as ridiculous as it sounds, the, the cheating, the divorce, the love with Javier, the breakup and the Europe trip happened over the span of like three and a half months. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it happened over three and a half months and you wrote it in three and a half months. Yeah, right. It, it was insanely fast. The whole process of everything. It was like, we got to get this book. It's like, she's got to go through it now. Um, so it was really quick. This is obviously spans over two years and it's like, so I'm sitting writing and I go, okay, 2017 with this person, what was this conversation? Where, where were we? What was said? Um, which is really important to me. Like I save all of my text messages and all of my everything because I know that I'll need to like clue myself in to, to make sure that it's authentic and I'm writing what was really written uh, or what was really happening and said. Um, and it's also difficult because yes, I'm in this happy, stable relationship right now with this man who is very much so the uh, main supporting character in book two. Um, But we lived this. So although he knows all of the times and things and people that popped in and out um, when we were apart, it's still not fun to reopen that. And it's still not fun that he's ever going to have to read that in detail. Um, And I can't write it with thinking that. I can't be like, oh, I'm trying to protect this person I love. So let me like tone this down. Like I can't do that A for myself, B for my readers and C for the success and authenticity of the book. Um, so it's it's really, it's an inner struggle for me to want to protect him um, and protect our relationship and our bond, um, but deliver what needs to to be there in the second book. It's, it's been a struggle and it's taken me a lot longer to write it. I mean, I'm also not putting pressure on myself. Um, my readers are, which I I think (laughs) is adorable and I appreciate. Um, but I've never been like, okay, I have to, you know, sit down and get this book out in a year. Um, I've kind of just been doing it as it's, as it's come. Um, so it's, it's been a longer, different process for sure. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. But it's it's an interesting journey. And I really appreciate and respect how authentic you are in sharing all of your experiences, even when it's hard, and you really want to protect protect what you have now in this strong bond and with this person you love so much, but keeping it authentic and keeping it real to say, you know, it's really going to show how the different twists and turns it took to get where you are now. And it's not an easy they don't just walk into your life. And it's like, whoa, perfect. Found them. God, not at all. I wish. Um, Thank you for that. And no, it's it, it's so opposite of of the easy just walking into your life. And I think as much, you know, obviously I wasn't going to keep my relationship a secret on social media for two years or however long until the book made its way out. Um, but I think people that are fans of Eat, Pray, FML um, that end up reading book two, are still going to be like shocked and really surprised at the fact that we even made it to where we are um, because the, the road was so windy and curvy and up and down. Um, And uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of 
almost all of the men from Eat, Pray, FML make an appearance. Um, it's so in, exciting. And in, in some way, <laughs> in book two, <laughs> you're so cute. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, and I'm, I answer every question that, that people were left lingering with um, from the first one. <laughs> awesome. I look forward to it. <laughs> well, it's so great too, that you have FML Talk, your podcast, where you still continue, like, bring people on from from the book and from your life and get to have these conversations so you're we're not left completely high and dry which is great <laughs> totally yeah Jess um my best friend well her in the book her name is Jess her real name's Brittany but her episode aired today um so it's so it's just fun to be able to like you know keep that world going for the people that became so invested in it which I'm so appreciative of um so yeah it's it's fun to be able to be like okay you're gonna meet this person now um we I just recorded an episode with Mallory from Barcelona um so she's she comes on and it's it's just really cool that I I went on this solo trip and everyone that I met on the solo trip um that you know I spent more than a few hours with um, knew that I was writing the book, knew that this was a thing. I don't know if they knew what it was going to become, um, but I'm still friends with the majority of them. So they've met this random girl on this, this solo trip that they had no you know, intention of meeting and became a character in a book. All of these people are like real life, normal people. None of them are in the industry in any capacity. Um, and are now seeing it like turn into this wild like world that people are like, wait, you want me to come on your podcast? What? <laughs> um, but it's so fun. And it, it really, I, I'm so grateful the way that the, the, every person I met and the way that my story turned out has just been like more than I could have asked for. Yeah, that's incredible. And it's so cool to think. I love when you talk about the Torontos too. And I'm like, yeah, Toronto. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and I actually, I saw um, two of them in, when I went to Toronto in 2018. Um, and we ended up like going out, having dinner, getting drinks. Um, and they like showed me around the city for a little bit because I was out there for work. Um, and I, I still keep in touch with a lot of those people. Like it, it really, that trip was such a defining moment in my life. But I think anytime you solo travel or travel with a friend and meet people, um, the, the relationships you make when you're abroad and traveling, they end up being so much, um, they're, they happen quicker because when you solo travel, you don't have time to have that layer of like bullshit over you. <laughs> so everyone's just showing up as their authentic selves, which is such a breath of fresh air after, you know, being in LA all my life. And, um, <laughs> It's, it's so great. So the, they end up being, you know, you end up becoming fast friends with people and those usually stick. Absolutely. And I, it's so cool to read it as the age I am and, you know, the woman I am and what I'm pursuing because I'm young and I'm considering traveling abroad or studying abroad. And so not only taking away so much about love and romance and heartbreak and that all in this, there's so much to take away too. It's just being yourself. And, and I love what you always say, like, you know, you're like, oh, I got the footnote version down of whenever people ask, why are you here? Why are you traveling? Yeah. <laughs> and it's so, it's so amazing when you do fully lead with yourself and you take off that bullshit later how fast you can connect with people yeah and it's so much more fulfilling on your end as a human too because it's like you don't have to hide behind this mask and pretend and like get through like layers and stuff it's just it's a better way to live and it's a better way to receive other people I think um I also can't believe that you're 19 that's insane <laughs> um this I is hear probably, that a lot I've done hundreds and hundreds of interviews and you are one of the better interviewers and have incredible questions so I'm shocked that you're 19. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm blushing. <laughs> I appreciate that. I it's I've heard, you know, people have said that I don't come across as 19 and I I appreciate that a lot and I definitely was very nervous when I started the podcast to lead with this thing that I'm putting so much of myself out there, but I've just started to learn even in the past week. I'm starting to like, you know, be like, you know what? This is this is what I do and I'm passionate and I love it and as soon as you start putting that energy out there, it comes right back. And it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing to see and experience. Yeah, that's so, that's so great. I'm so happy for you. It's when you start 
finding that true spark inside yourself and you're like, well, I fucking love this spark. So I don't really give a shit what the world thinks. I'm going to let it shine. Um, that's when all the people and all the, the energies in the universe start becoming attracted to that. And it's this magical like mixture that comes to be. It's really wonderful. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I was so excited when you were like, yeah, I'll totally come on your podcast. And then I started thinking about the questions I wanted to ask. And I'm like, okay, I want to know what advice you have for someone. Like I love writing and I definitely want to write a book about my experiences in my life. And I'm curious advice that you would give since you've you know done it and are still in the process. Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, and I always say, you just have to sit down and start writing. There's no like prep. There's no organization. I didn't do an outline. I didn't take a class for it. I was not, I didn't consider myself a writer by any means. Um, You just have to sit down and start writing. I will say, write about what you know or what you're passionate about. Um, I've been asked a couple of times to ghost write and I always say no, because it's just, I want to write about the things that I'm, you know, experiencing and creating. Um, So to just sit down and write you know, and you can always go back and rearrange and change. Um, I always suggest to, to work with an editor, no matter what, um, like a professional good editor. Um, mine was fantastic, um, because she didn't try and change anything. It was really just like, okay, we don't need to hear about you eating another meal and seeing some more sites. So let's take this out and you can expand on this healing stuff more. I was like, oh, great. Um, But she didn't try and change any of it. So it was very much like this really beautiful process to, to work through and edit it. And a lot of really juicy stuff came up in the edit because I was learning and healing more. So I was able to like then expand on certain things that I had previously written about. Mm, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's crazy hearing that advice because I'm like, I give people the same advice when they ask about starting Ah. a podcast. I'm like, that was in me. I could (laughs) have, you know, but it's do it. (laughs) Yeah, it's just amazing to hear it and and hear it from, you know, someone who's done it and is, is still doing it because it's true. Like when you follow the things you're passionate about. And when, you know, when we can sit and really be like, why am I experiencing this? Or why am I feeling this? Or how can I do this thing I really want to do? The answers are always inside of us. And I think we forget that. And we always look outside. Yeah, completely. And I think that fear of what it could look like often scares us or derails us from just doing it. Um, that's the same thing for me in the podcast. It's like, I don't want to do a podcast, dude. Everybody has a podcast. I've been a guest on a hundred of them. What the hell do I even have to say on a podcast? And it's been like this totally wonderful experience um, that's completely like opened me up in a new way um, and allowed me to like continuously connect with people. Um, So it's the same thing as writing a book. Like, yeah, it sounds fucking daunting when you think about it. You're like, wait, what? Like, it's, it's a lot. Um, But like, I just sat down and wrote it, you know, like you just do it. And then, (laughs) then you go back and they're like, okay, what do I need to tweak? What do I need to, you know, reform? But you just, and I think that's like anything in life. If you want something and you're passionate about it and you feel it inside of you, you just got to do it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And then that even takes me to here being like, if you read a book or appreciate something that someone is doing, I just reached out and, and you responded to me so quickly. And I was like, oh, it's, it's that easy. You, right. It, you, like, <laughs> like, yeah, some things are super hard and you have to work at it for a long time. But I was like, I'm loving this book. And, and you never know. I think we put people on such pedestals, too. But it's incredible to sit here and have this conversation with you and be like, wow, you are just openly talking about your experiences. And and, and so many people and myself included, especially can relate to all of that. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, I think it's really important that for me, especially quarantine was kind of this weird blessing. Um, one, because I found the time to, and boredom, I guess, to go on TikTok, which is where so much of my content ended up going viral. Um, but also because I was at home, you know, I was writing and I was, you know, starting the podcast and stuff, but I wasn't like traveling for work. I wasn't on set. Um, so I had a lot of time to really connect with a lot of my readers. So Anytime someone DMs me about the book, I read it, I respond like I it's like a full time job, but that's what I signed up for. I didn't put out a book that was like my story about, you know, da 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 da. It it was like I knew that it was going to be therapy for a lot of people. And I get essay messages in my DMs and I read and respond to them all. Um, That's amazing. it's, It's important for me to connect with the people that 
you know, have resonated with it. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And I love it. It's important. It's, it's, it's exciting to read and and relate to. And I can't wait to see more of your story unfold and get to read about it soon, hopefully. Thanks, girl. I'm working away on it. So hopefully, um, in the not too, too distant future, uh, we will be chatting about the second one. For sure. Awesome. And if someone has listened to this whole thing and has not like checked you out already on social media, (laughs) I'm like, you can shout out your social medias, but make sure you like read Eat, Pray, FML, check out FML Talk, Gabrielle Stone on Instagram. You want to shout out any more Platform. No, yeah, the the book is available um, exclusively on Amazon, so you can only either get it on Amazon or on my website, which is eatprayfml.com, where we have like all the cute merch and stuff too. You can get a signed copy there, um, or it's on Amazon uh, in paperback, ebook, and audiobook, which I narrate. Um, and I'm at Gabrielle Stone on all platforms. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was amazing. It was so great to meet you and get to dive into all of this further. You are so welcome. And if I ever am hanging out with the the Torontos again, you'll have to come and meet us. (laughs) Oh my God, please. I would love that. That would be like a dream come true. That'd be so fun. (laughs) We will make it happen the next time I'm there. (laughs) Sounds good. I'm like, okay, pandemic, when are you gone? (laughs) Right, right. Come on, let's go, let's go. (laughs) Yeah. Talking with Gabrielle Stone was an absolute dream come true. It was so much fun. Make sure you read her book, Eat, Pray, FML. It's amazing. And make sure you follow us on Instagram at human to human pod. Follow me at jessica j mcdonald subscribe so you make sure you're notified whenever episodes come out every tuesday stay tuned because we got some bonus ones coming this month i get to talk about ghosting i get to (laughs) Who, who says it like that who wants to be able to talk about ghosting but anyway thank you so much for listening and i will see you next tuesday love you